Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? The first story this week regards autism and a possible predictive element in the form of sex hormones. Research from Denmark and the UK has found an association between the concentration of sex steroids in the mother and the amniotic fluid and the probability of developing autism later in life. The relationship between sex steroids and autism is not new, as the male brain hypothesis has been going on for many decades, and other competing hypotheses have also been around for a similar period. This study was small and based on Denmark's biobank datasets. They are able to examine amniotic fluid from a little under 300 children. 98 of the children were found to be autistic later in life. When examining the concentrations of the various steroids within the amniotic fluid, they found that there were four that were particularly different from the otherwise healthy children in the same study. The most important of these appears to be estrogen, which also happens to contradict a number of other studies that have found the opposite effect. The study is small in scale and is yet to be compared against a female autistic population, which may demonstrate a difference in effect between the sexes. This may also be playing on other genetic factors that creates a very complex picture. Next is a perfect example of peer review succeeding in what it's meant to do. There was a recent peer-reviewed article published that took aim at the human papilloma virus vaccine, otherwise known as the HPV vaccine. This treats a significant cause of mortality amongst women and men, leading to things like cervical cancer, penile cancer, throat cancers, and many others. The HPV vaccine effectively stopped this from occurring and is a significant achievement in the modern medical industry. Over the years it has been available on the market as a publicly available vaccine. The detractors have been taking aim at it time and again, but have failed to produce any substantial evidence that the HPV vaccine is neither safe nor effective. One example of these hit pieces was published last year and fundamentally tried to argue that America's low birth rate is caused in part by the HPV vaccine. Naturally, this was taken with a rather large grain of salt. In fact, the entire thing became very salty. The fundamental argument by DeLong was that women who had received the HPV vaccine were less likely to get pregnant than those who did not. This would mean that if everybody who had received the HPV vaccine was accounted for, there should have been 2 million fewer births. This rather drastic tapering has not occurred, and as such, the conclusion of the article itself by an economics researcher on a health-related issue is not really well substantiated. More so when you consider that there should be a lag between the administration of the vaccine and the eventual pregnancy, as the vaccine itself is primarily targeted towards pre-teens, and the rate of teen pregnancy, although rising slightly, this should not have an immediate effect on the outcome measured in the form of birth rate. The study itself, as such as you could call it, was an examination of 700 people within the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. This normally accrues 8 million data points over the year. The study itself only used 700 of these, and the division between control and experimental group was even more skewed, where 400 females were allocated to the not-vaccinated group. As one commentator pointed out, the women who were in the vaccinated group were also more likely to be more highly educated, often having a college degree. Being professional women, they were more likely to have children at an older age. 
as a result, if you read through the comments section for this particular article, you will find that a variety of researchers have picked out many of the flaws that are there. Individually, they may not have accounted for all of the errors in the methodologies and conclusions, but in totality, peer review has successfully identified not only the flaws within the research, but the very methodology used to get there, and why the conclusions, such as they are, are not substantiated by the facts. This is compounded by superior quality studies that have looked at hundreds of thousands of women, rather than just 700 within a narrow age group and within an isolated area, and have found that the HPV vaccine may in fact be increasing fertility. If you have been around this channel for a while, the next story should not surprise you. The FDA has recently released a statement telling people not to drink bleach. To most people, this should be common sense. Unfortunately, there is a relatively small proportion of the population that thinks drinking something called Miracle Mineral Solution, Miracle Mineral Cure, and a variety of other names will resolve all of their ailments. Worse yet, it will resolve the ailments of the vulnerable people they are responsible for, such as children with autism, those with cancer, and other otherwise uncurable conditions. As has been described in two previous videos, Miracle Mineral Solution is an industrial bleach. It will destroy parts of your inside and is not healthy. It is a scam and it is extremely dangerous. This is what makes the FDA's warning both so ridiculous and so disturbing that it should be necessary. In the UK and America, provision of Miracle Mineral Solution as a consumable product and not an industrial cleaner or similar is illegal. Now to counter these arguments and to show people the bleaching properties of chlorine dioxide, I actually acquired some online. Now here's something that's really interesting. I actually got a letter from the government a couple of weeks later. Strictly private and confidential. Purchase of Miracle Mineral Solution, MMS. The National Food Crime Unit, NFCU. I can't believe we have a National Food Crime Unit. That's quite cool, do you think? Can you imagine? Pow, pow, pow. I'm not going to put this in the video. Has recently received information which indicates that a quantity of the chemical referred to as Miracle Mineral Solution, Master Mineral Solution, MMS, a toxic solution of 28% sodium chloride in distilled water, has been purchased and sent to this address. The NFCU is aware that this substance is advertised online for purpose of human consumption. Sodium chloride is marketed as a water purifier. It is, however, not safe for human consumption. When taken directly, it could cause severe nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, potentially leading to dehydration and reduced blood pressure. If the solution is diluted to less than instructed, it could cause damage to the gut and red blood cells, potentially resulting in respiratory failure. The Food Standards Agency published guidelines against the use and sale of this in the United Kingdom. And then we have a link. Further advice can of course be sought from a health professional, such as your GP. I would like to reassure you that you are not under investigation for any criminal offence. We are writing to you principally in order to ensure you are aware of the significant risks of consuming this substance. Once again, you are urged in the strongest terms not to ingest this chemical or to encourage others to do so. Please also note that the sale of MMS for human consumption does constitute as a criminal offence relating to the sale of unsafe food. Purchasing it is tracked for this reason to ensure people are not buying and using it as a supplement. Those who are are being duped or worse. Unfortunately, MMS is not the only example of ridiculous notions people get in their mind to use as a way of getting better. Another case study came out recently in which a woman received second degree burns from vaginal steam. This is yet another unfortunate, stupid, and in this case dangerous fad popularized by Gwyneth Paltrow and a ridiculous site Goop. This is several magnitudes worse than putting a bacterial laden jade egg into your vagina, 
Selling stickers that are claimed to be made from the same material NASA uses in their spacesuits or a several thousand dollar solid gold pleasure device. The patient in this case was receiving treatment by a traditional Chinese doctor who had provided two sessions involving the steam. Unfortunately, this also involved considerable damage before they sent her to the emergency department. That is how they wound up being diagnosed with burns. The reason they were receiving this treatment is that they had a vaginal prolapse. It is a condition not uncommon after childbirth and can be addressed via surgery. In more severe cases, in less severe cases, surgery may not be necessary. This patient received a topical antibiotic and had to delay their surgery to fix an issue that could have been dealt with months beforehand if they had not opted to go with the alternative treatment. The next case study is also interesting, but for a very different reason. The case study is one of an elderly male patient who, after falling, went into the hospital and had an x-ray done of his pelvic region. After doing so, the doctors found that his penis had begun to ossify, or in other words, his boner was turning into a bone. A variety of salts had begun to build up in the soft tissue. This led to them solidifying into a plaque along the entire shaft, and this only became visible after the x-ray was conducted. Unfortunately, more information is not forthcoming as the patient left the hospital against medical advice shortly after being given this information. The next piece of medical news is at least good news of a kind. There is strong evidence that a stage 1 clinical trial may be moved into for a chlamydia vaccine. Over the last 60 odd years, researchers have been looking for a way to treat chlamydia that is not reliant upon antibiotics. This is a problem as chlamydia is increasingly resistant to the standard antibiotics used in treating it. As a consequence, Vaccines have been tested for years. Some have had limited success, some have been absolute failures, leaving the patients more vulnerable to the condition. The need for a prophylactic treatment is increasing, as chlamydia is the most common sexually transmitted disease. And, as it is a bacterial infection, there are normally ways to provide some sort of vaccine for this. The lack of research into it is a combination of a historical lack of need, funding, and difficulty in actually getting a vaccine developed. This one that has achieved stage 1 clinical trials was first and foremost intended to demonstrate safety. As was stated earlier, previous vaccines have left participants more vulnerable to infection. This one had the opposite effect where immunogenicity studies found that there was a significant increase in the immune response being a very early stage 1 clinical trial outcome, there is a lot more work to be done yet, but there is a good chance that this will move on to at least stage 2, where further data can be found and analysed to improve the probability that a vaccine will be developed in the near future. In more unnerving news, Japanese researchers have found a way to select for the sex of a sperm in mice. At least in theory, a sample of sperm would contain an equal mixture of X and Y chromosome carrying sperm. No matter what weird ritualistic sex practice you follow, it is unlikely to have an effect on which of these eventually gets into the egg. Until very recently, it was thought that sperm were identical, other than what they carried internally. This made selecting for one sex or the other nearly impossible. The Hiroshima University researchers found that there were roughly 500 genes active in the X-carrying sperm that were not in the Y. Of these, a number coded for surface proteins 
these can in theory allow you to select for which sperm are to be used. The researchers took advantage of this mechanism by having a chemical bind to these proteins. This then slowed them down as they were moving across the surface. By selecting those that moved the quickest, they were able to get up to 90% male litters. Meanwhile, by choosing the slowest, they had an 81% success rate for female litters. As you can imagine, based on past evidence from China's one-child policy, being able to select the gender of a child carries with it significant ethical issues. In upbeat and positive news, the FDA has approved a new treatment for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is incredibly dangerous, mostly because it is very hard to treat. It kills about one and a half million people each year, and half a million more will suffer from a drug-resistant strain. The reason it is so difficult to treat is that the tuberculosis bacterium produces a coating around itself that medication has a hard time penetrating. This new drug targets that medication-resistant variety that is even harder to treat than the normal tuberculosis. What is especially pertinent in this approval is that it is a new antibiotic. At present, there is very little capital investment into the discovery and improvement, if not release, of new antibiotics. This is important in a time where we have an increasing demographic of antibiotic resistant bacteria that we are running out of solutions to. The TB antibiotic is called Pretomatid and is part of a three drug regimen. This helps it solve the issue of getting into highly resistant forms of tuberculosis. It is one of only three FDA approved tuberculosis drugs that have been allowed in the last 40 years. Another study has examined how scientists can help to reduce or restrict the spread and damage of breast cancer. One avenue of investigation has been able to turn the breast cancer cells into fat cells in mice. The researchers were taking advantage of cellular adaptation to local damage. They did this by using two drugs. One is a drug for diabetes called rosiglitazone, and the second is a cancer treatment called tramnetinib. Under normal circumstances, or when the fetus is growing, epithelial cells will undergo a process of adaptation or the kind of transition. This allows the cells to change shape and then reform into the type of cell needed to fill the gap from damage. In some cases, the opposite occurs, and this is called the mesenchymal epithelial transition. Cancer cells take advantage of both ways this occurs. The medication cocktail described causes the cancer cells to turn into fat cells when they try to use either of these pathways. Interestingly, those cancer cells that did undergo the transformation did not change back later. This is something relevant to cancer cells that are generally more flexible in what they do. They have yet to establish whether or not this particular approach could be used in conjunction with, before, or after chemotherapy, but it may be a viable option for treatment of breast cancer in particular. It is unknown whether other forms of cancer would be equally susceptible to this approach. In very different views, chemists have successfully created a pure, stable ring of carbon. Carbon rings are not that unusual in nature. Consider glucose. However, it uses a conjoiner in the form of an oxygen molecule. Researchers have been able to use that idea in the past to create buckyballs. These are multiple rings of carbon that are bound to each other, creating a sheet like graphite. This particular study has created a solitary ring of pure carbon without any extra supporting structures. The reason this is so difficult to achieve 
is that carbon in this sort of environment becomes unstable and will quickly break down from the ring format. The research team is a combined effort from Oxford University and IBM's research department. The format and structure of this, along with its other properties, means it has potential use in electronics, particularly as a semiconductor. This could be important as we move further and further away from Moore's law being true. Having these tiny semiconductors could, at least in theory, lead to much smaller computing units. As this particular method only produces a 13% yield, it's unlikely that this will lead to consumer-level products any time in the near future, but it may lead to significantly better industrial or highly specialized research capacity. In very disturbing news, and adding to all of the other things that Facebook has done recently, an insider has leaked information confirming that Facebook has indeed been listening into its app's users' conversations. Facebook has previously stated before Congress that they do not do this. Talking about uh, uh, really kind of an uh, experience they've had uh, where they're having a conversation uh, with friends, uh, not on the phone, just talking, uh, and then they see ads popping up fairly quickly uh, uh, on their Facebook. So I've heard constituents fear that Facebook is mining audio from uh, their mobile devices uh, for the purpose of, of ad targeting, which I think speaks to this lack of trust that we're seeing here. But, uh, and I understand there's some technical issues and logistical issues for that to happen. But for the record, I think it's clear, seeing I hear it all the time, including from my own staff. Uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. The contractor who was brought in and later confirmed by Facebook has stated that they do indeed do this. Facebook has defended the practice by saying that they've only ever used it to confirm their speech recognition capacity. There is a good chance that this will also run afoul of the General Data Protection and Retention Act in Europe which may lead to significant fines being levied against Facebook there and in America. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post it in comments, questions, or suggestions below.